watching Carlson, part of the ITV network. Now it's time for the truth about women and their men. I think you should ask John Wayne Bobbitt if women have become too aggressive. Oh, very much so. <laughs> oh, totally. I think they'd shoot you if you didn't know how to spell feminist, never mind love them. Strident. Did we castrate you up? Oh, damn. Man hating. Don't open the door for me. I can open the door myself. Ball breaking. We wanted those balls after all. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> My wife sees this, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I was invited to speak at Southampton University and afterwards this student, this guy who was the equality officer, were having a cup of tea and he tells me this very sad story. He's a perfectly nice chap, he doesn't look too much like a spud, I mean he's not obviously offensive in any way and basically he can't get laid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, there's a guy in his hall of residence who has announced on the first day of the student year that he is going to lay every single woman in the block. And the, the guy I'm talking to is baffled because the women are queuing up outside the guy's room. I mean, you know, legs akimbo, just ready to roar. And he, can't, he just doesn't get it. He's like, hang on a second, he's the guy they're supposed to hate. I'm the guy they're supposed to like, and he's the guy who's getting all the action. How can, how can that happen? Women have the upper hand in everything. I mean, I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, uh, in terms of, you know, even divorce settlements and things like that. It all goes to women's ways. They've got all this sort of legislation to protect them. And the poor old men are on the retreat everywhere. They don't really know what they're doing. They don't know what their rights are anymore. They don't know what their role is anymore. It's much, much easier to be a woman these days than it is to be a man. I think men uh, wouldn't be able to understand women's messages, even if they're only one word long. They're not very clear about what they want. They send out so many mixed signals. That's, for men, it's become a minefield. It's the Billy Conley thing of, uh, I want you to do this, that, this, that, and that, and I'm going to change it all tomorrow. You know, I think that women are kind of, you know, we're contrary creatures. Well, today, she wants me to be in control. So you go. So and then, then the next day, it's like, no, you've got to stand back and let her do everything. You know, we want you to be sensitive, and we want you to share our problems, and when you, you, we want you to accept us as hardworking executives. On the other hand, we also want you to be the tough, macho guy who, when we decide that the time is right, picks us up, flings us on the bed, and does the wild thing. Are you ready out there? Here we go, there! We are in the West End of London. We'll be watching the Dream Boys tonight. They're really good fun. And it's just a load of women having a laugh and uh, drinking a lot and getting very silly. It's basically a girls' night out. So they're turning the tables around, having guys dancing on pedestals, guys dancing on tables. There's a full show there. It's just generally so the girls can let their hair down. Table dance is just basically a strip at a table um, down to a G-string. They have a system with tokens. They're tokens of different values depending on how much you want to see. <laughs> it's a night where the girls can go without their boyfriends and go home in and just have a laugh about it. Having a very sexually charged atmosphere is very dangerous. Yes! <laughs> you catch me there. You can't seriously get turned on by these guys just waving around because, as you know, women are not necessarily... Oh, you're waving around. Well, I'd probably get chucked out for touching. Nah. I'm not really into men like that with bodies. Oh, God, if he did that in my bedroom, I just could not have sex with him. I'd just be rolling around pissing myself laughing. 
Do you know, I can't think of anything that I want to do less. I'd rather see women take their clothes off than men. The last thing I want to do, I've got something silk or satin on, is somebody's great oily buttocks you know, wriggling into my silk and satins. The fact of the matter is that women get their rocks off at those places. And you'll often hear women say, oh, no, 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 it's ironic. We go there and we laugh. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> go there and you scream and your pulses race and your hormones go mad and your eyes dilate and you throw your knickers, which is great. That's what it's there for. There is something that, <clears throat> when you have a load of women all screaming, you do find yourself joining in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at him. Scream the place down. And you think, what am I doing? <laughs> I used to be able to take that's manager and go into some of the concerts to see the guys perform. You'd see signs in the audience with Rob, Rob, show us your knob or Howard, sling your erection in my direction. And you're thinking, you know, they can't be more than 14. Women can no longer get pretentious and precious and hoity-toity about men going to see female lap dancers. I know girls behave badly. I'm one of them. I am so bad when I'm out with my girlfriends. I've been known to pull my car up outside a boys' school and, and wolf whistle and shout obscenities at boys. I'm completely out of control when I'm with my girlfriends. And it's childish, I know, but it's repressed. And it's got to come out. No, I, I only ever want to see naked men in my also, bedroom. They all take steroids. I'm sure they take steroids. <laughs> and they have that they strange do. smell of off cheese. <laughs> Strippers, they do. I've met a few, believe me. <laughs> oh, no, not nice. Well, you know, we all have personal tastes. Mine, I like a woman to be shaped like a cello. <laughs> In and out. Va -va -boom. High heels work. Stockings work. On the right bottom and the right pair of legs, short skirts work. The short skirt should be encouraged at all times, really, and, and, and the wearing of suspenders should be compulsory, I think. Stockings and suspenders, that, if I was in government, I would push that through as a matter of some urgency. Well, actually, I mean, personally, I like curvaceous women. Blonde hair, blue eyes, small nippled. Most men would probably say boobs. Breasts, I think. She'd say her breasts, probably. Now, I do like lively eyes, but you can't, you can't beat breasts. Every guy's dream is to go over to, you know, a page three model. Wonder bras really work. That's why they sell in huge quantities. Probably the back. As hairless as possible. I like bottoms, I think. Legs. Good hip bottom and thigh area. For myself, what I don't really like to see in a woman is dirty fingernails. I don't know why. It's got a brain to go with it and a good sense of humour. I don't know, her face, probably. I know he's just a lie. It's just a lie. We just tell you what you think you want to hear. Yeah. Of course, it's breasts. What about? That? <laughs> I think that what we've done, by and large, is exchange one form of sexism for another form of sexism. Let's put it this way: if there is reincarnation, I don't want to come back as a man. So that, having had for hundreds of years a sexism which said men are strong and tough and clever. And women are little flippity gibbets who shouldn't think at all because it'll ruin their pretty little heads. We've now kind of swapped that for a, for a sexism which says that women are very deep and sensitive and meaningful and sharing, caring creatures, um, and men are just dumb. I had to fill in a questionnaire recently. Which living person do you most despise? And I said, whoever it was that came up with the concept of the new lad. Oh, I'm really sick, and all I care about is beer and footy. But if you let me have my silly boyish things, I'll pretend that, in fact, you're much cleverer than me. I don't think new lads are all that different from old lads, to be honest with you. It's just the idea that all of a sudden now it's suddenly hip to, to like football again and drink beer. Which would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that a lot of the people are doing that are not kind of 18-year-old morons, but actually 38-year-old quite intelligent people who are pretending to be morons. Just go and look in your average news agent. Any sense of shame or restraint has gone. I used to buy Cosmopolitan. How to give a woman a multiple orgasm. I go buy that one. 
<laughs> up until then, they're always ribbing magazines, because men were talking about hunting with knives and going fishing and stuff like that. I think that's why FHM and all those kind of magazines have just exploded, because it's filling a huge gap for guys. Guys want to know about gels, waxes, new haircuts, clothes. We've had girly magazines for ages talking about periods and and boyfriends and Backstreet Boys and take that, you know, so men should have their own thing. I think, also, I read loaded. I think it's hilarious. I think we love women. You know, we recognise that men like pretty girls, but there's more to it than that. We try to make them smart, the people we interview, uh, you know, encourage them to be funny. I wrote a feature called 40 Reasons Why You're Pathetic, and I met quite a lot of men afterwards going, oh, my God, you know, I ticked off 38 of those, you know. I think that if men are prepared for people to know that that's how um, Neanderthal they are, then, you know, it, the only reflection really is on men. I've been on the cover. I was voted Ladette of the Year by one of those magazines. I don't think I can decry them, actually. I have. I've been on the cover. I'm very proud of that. In bra and pants. Melinda Messenger was naked, but I had to wear bra and pants. So I don't think there's anything wrong at all with seeking to be a bit glamorous. We all go through that stage, don't we? Amazingly, they had no interest in me taking my kit off when I offered it to them. Women fall into two categories a lot of the time. They're either good-looking or they're smart and, you know, ne'er the twain shall meet. Yeah, we make women sexy, but, uh, you know, the truth is that men like women to be sexy. I'm sure women like men to be sexy, too. I find it quite flattering um, to be seen as a sex object. <laughs> it's literally as if the kind of sexual revolution never happened. It's all good, clean, dirty fun, isn't it? I think men think of women in sexual terms constantly because 99% of the time we're driven by our groins. I mean, I'm a martyr to my testosterone myself, but you just can't help it. You know, all men, in a way, have taken a stupid pill when they get to the age of 14 and the two terrorists in their underpants take over. All they've got on their mind is their penis. It's just bollocks. I mean, I, I don't think those magazines are acceptable, and I think they're just making it fine, all this kind of tittering schoolboy stuff. It's degrading men and it's degrading women, and it's just like, I've got no time for it at all. But obviously, I mean, I'll do an interview for Loaded if it's going to sell my book. The raunchiest thing I've done personally in the magazine was when I had to live as a woman for a week. I think it's called getting in touch with your feminine side, um, which I think is a load of <clears throat> horlicks. Well, it must be really difficult being a woman, you know, so hopefully if I spend a day sort of as one, it'll maybe give me a wee bit more insight into sort of how they function and stuff. I might get a girlfriend as a result. OK, then. Um, this little baby here. He's going to be long enough. <laughs> Surely they're not going to be long enough. It is a lot of effort, yes. My heart goes out to all you ladies out there. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't get this to work at all. Oh, God. How's that? Just a pain in the arse, really, isn't it? <laughs> the only inconvenience a man has is shaving. Ow. You know? He doesn't get pregnant. <sighs> he doesn't have all these hormones whizzing around. He doesn't get his period once a month. <sighs> ah! It's like Robin Williams says, you know, if guys think that they can sympathise with a woman having a baby, not until they've passed a ten-pound bowling ball will they know the pain. He's not going to have a truck driven through his vagina. God, that sounds crude, but it is so true. I am very, very firmly in the cigar and bottle of whiskey in the corridor camp when it comes to childbirth. I think they should be manacled to the delivery bed. I don't want to see uh, what, by all accounts, looks like uh, an explosion in a ragu tomato sauce factory. I was present at the birth of all my children, but I wasn't sober. 
personally, I think you've got 18 years to bond with your child, you know, and then, you know, another seven years to pay all his bills. If my partner wanted me to be present at the birth, then I would be, but I certainly wouldn't stray down to the leg end. <laughs> I think I'd probably rather stay at the top end as well. I'm a bit squeamish. Birth is the same as mountaineering. Don't look down. Whatever you do, you go up to the head of the bed. Don't look down. You will never, ever have a decent sex life ever again with your partner if you look down. How many women have slept with? Four. Six. Thirty. Forty. Jeez, way up in 2,000 plus. These women are becoming to be monsters out there. How on earth are women are supposed to walk in these bloody things? And I do feel extremely foolish walking around with this on. The men should never try and understand women. As soon as they understand us, we've lost. <laughs>Every time you watch Disney's classic Peter Pan, something magical happens. Fly away to Never Never Land with one of the best-loved and most memorable Disney stories of all. Now digitally remastered, Peter Pan is yours to own on video. Walt Disney's timeless classic, Peter Pan, it's the video you'll never grow out of. Some thoughts on a new way to wear satin. Wouldn't it be great if everything you'd wear could be as soft and comfortable? There's satin, Tampax satin. An amazing design with a silky smooth finish on the outside. And this gently rounded tip so it's more comfortable to use. Tampax satin. I love wearing satin. Me too. Tampax. Women know. There are so many lipsticks designed to be lasting or caring. But to find one that does both, who would you listen to? Me, magazines, a friend. In a recent independent survey, four out of five women who tried an Oil of Ulay lipstick said they'd recommend it to a friend. And tests prove it does care. And it does last. And the name? Oil of Ulay's Colour Moist Lipstick, as recommended by four out of five women. We can prove long-lasting colour can care. How would you feel about a hair colour that's actually good for your hair? Natural instincts from Clairol has aloe, jojoba, and ginseng, giving you rich, natural-looking color, and your hair's better condition than before you colored it. Go a little natural with Clairol Natural Instincts, now with aloe replenishing conditioner. Oh, oh, oh he's... Here, Vincent, don't be sminting again. What? Smint. Intensely stimulating flavors. Now I have started using this new personal performance. That shirt, Max's favourite. Wherever he is, whatever he's doing, he'll be wearing it. This new personal performance helps stop the colours running into the whites. He couldn't put that shirt to anything more, so I wouldn't wash it in anything less. New personal performance. Don't let thrush spoil your day. Only Caniston Combi has a cream to cool immediately, while a pessary gets right to the spot to clear infection fast. So when you get thrush, cool it and clear it with Caniston Combi. I didn't want a desk job. Keep your feet on the ground, the careers teacher said. Come lunchtime, I'm starving. Which is why I like this new Nor Tomato and Basil taste break soup with pasta and croutons. It's tasty, rich and thick. Sort of like my dream man. Lead a normal life with no taste breaks. So, Ivan, have you ever had a tower before? You bet, darling. <laughs> the KFC Fillet Tower Burger. So, see? Oh. Um, Come on, break the bank. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's just gone up to a pound, so have a lovely day. Cheeky. Ooh. We'll have a coffee someday when you're back in the area, maybe. See, I'm turning heads. How on earth women are supposed to walk in these bloody things is absolutely beyond me. Right, I just want to stop now. I'm going to stop. Here. I'm stopping. Here. Ah! I feel like Lily Savage. Same. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
feet are killing me. I can't believe the day I had. Get back to work. I mean, if you'd like someone in the street, you'd look past and like say, you know, rough looking bird probably, but uh, he looks a lot better than we thought he would do. I thought he'd look much more like himself. He doesn't look like himself at all. Just a very sort of scary secretary, <laughs> secretary type, really, but. There is Lorraine from EastEnders in there, definitely. <clears throat> you have got a trendy face, but you just look like a complete bird. Leave it alone. He looks like the bastard child of, a, I don't know, <laughs> RuPaul and Nigel from EastEnders. <laughs> oh God, so this is what it's like. Right. So this is as far as you go, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm writing about love. I'm writing entirely about love all the time. And that's why the, the, the Russians have done it so well. They've said, love comes from the heart and the soul. I think it's a very good thing to go. You know, when you're young, you giggle at poor magazines and, and rude things and, you know, erotic movies or whatever. Um, when you grow up, you realise, you know, <laughs> The real purpose and you know you sort of appreciate it and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I, I think men feel sometimes quite threatened by women who like pornography or you know erotica whatever um, but I don't have a problem with it with beads of perspiration gathering at her throat and trickling down between her breasts she noticed the broad sweep of his nicely muscled shoulders his equally bare knees trembling ever so slightly I started writing about three years ago and I specialise in writing erotica for women. As far as I know, there, there is no average type of woman that buys it. The age range is really broad, from late teens right up to, you know, women in their 70s or 80s. I get the most wonderful letters, massive letters from men, saying it's so marvellous to write a book about love. I won't write about sex, you see. So the only place I don't sell quite pretty well is England, because they want sex and they can't have sex for me. The hands shielding his groin were forced to spread themselves apart as his cock hardened and nudged at them. She felt herself grow warm as she watched him walk away from her. I do think that women should have the chance to enjoy the same thing more frequently. We don't. I bought some of those magazines that have naked guys in them, and they're just such grotty-looking, vain guys. <laughs> you know, they're sort of lying on their car with a willy hanging over the hood of the car. It's like... They're just such burks, the guys that want to be photographed. I wish there was more penises in movies. I'd, I'd love to see more. Men, thank you, wither. It's illegal. I, what, why is that? In good films, not stupid ones, with guys in the back, someone's back room in Dagenham going... <gasps> is it dangerous? Is it going to kill you? I don't think so. Can you imagine all the male movie stars, you know, if it became a thing where, you know, you really have to show your dicks now, guys. You know, it's a big box office draw on the thing when they sort of operation they'd start having and the special lenses and the body doubles they'd start to get. We're allowed to have guns and murders and, and blowing up and things like that in movies, but no stippies. Equally, the high taut mounds of his buttocks were a delicious sight. They were so tight they displayed not the slightest hint of wobble as he walked. I'm embarrassed if I think about who might be reading it, i.e. a member of my family and especially my mum. I did give my mother a copy of the first book I wrote and then I said to her after that, I said, please promise me you won't read any more because otherwise I won't be able to carry on writing if I think you're going to be reading it. Contemplating it, she licked her lips with salacious hunger. It was nine inches of pure pleasure-giving meat. <laughs> the main thing that women get wrong about men is that they attribute far too much intelligence to us. They think that we're scheming all the time. Uh, they think that we're thinking all the time. I just bought this book in America, actually, at the airport, and I was bought called The Rules. Have you heard about this book called The Rules? It, it is the biggest pile of poppycock I have ever, ever read in my life. This whole thing of, you mustn't ever phone the man, and he's always got to phone you, and if he phones up and asks to see you the next day, don't. I think this is amazing that women think men have the, the wherewithal to get together and make these rules of dating. The rules of dating a woman, okay. Um, 
First date, don't go anywhere public that um, they could end up being somebody that laughs like a giraffe. Men don't have a bloody clue. <laughs> you know, they just turn up, wear a different aftershave, uh, shall I open my shirt, three buttons, one button, shall I pretend to be Italian? I've gone out for meals sometimes, and before even the starters arrived, I'm thinking, I'd like to go home, please. And by the time they ask if you want dessert, you go, no, Bill, please, now. Chat out lines can either be very simple, hello, would you like a drink? Would you like to come round for a cup of coffee? That is the beautiful English expression, like, would you like to come around and have sex, you know? Or they can be so monstrously ridiculous as to make the woman just laugh. Yeah, well, actually, I'm a commodity broker, and I make 150 grand a year, and I've got an enormous penis, and my Porsche's just outside. You go up to a girl and you go, do you have a mirror in your pocket? And she goes, no. And he goes, that's odd, because I can see myself in your pants. Hi, my name's Peter String, and I own the place. Seems to work well for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think women are very cunning. They know what they're doing, don't they? They're like... What, about dating? Oh, yeah. I think so. I think, you know, they meet somebody, like, they're straight on the phone to and they're like, right, I gave him my number, but when he phones the first time, I'm not going to be in. When he phones the second time, um, you know, I'll get my friend to answer. Don't me. tell his secrets, girl. <laughs> One thing that I'm terrible for doing is that old set, setting the scene, OK? So you know, for example, that he's really into Miles Davis. So you leave all your Miles Davis records out <laughs> and all your pictures of, you know, jazz people. And it's terrible, you know, it's that kind of, oh, yes, I really love that. And I do it. It's awful. I'd never wait to be asked to go on a date. You know, if I see someone, I'd think, oh, he's crumpet, then I'd certainly go over and pass my number. <laughs> I don't know if I'd make the first move on a bloke, so that sounds a little bit seedy in a way, like, hey, I'm going to make an actual move on them, you know, shimmy over, like, you know, get the barman to go over and say, that lady over there sent you this raspberry martini, and I sort of do that from the corner of the bar. I wouldn't do anything like that. I think that I can definitely give out very strong signals if I fancy someone. I mean, I've just got it written all over my face. I'm all sort of like perky and kind of high and suddenly I'm wearing high heels and short skirts and, you know, I'm all sort of feminine. So if the guy doesn't pick that up, he must be thick. I'd never ask someone that, only because when I was about nine years old, we used to have these dancing classes at school. And there was this boy at school who was my friend. So this particular day, I decided to ask my friend if he'd done, if he'd be my partner in the class. So I said, went up to him and I said, oh, Philip, will you, will you dance with me today? And he turned around and he went, oh, don't be ridiculous. And all his friends standing around him all laughed. And, and I think it was the first time I became aware that, you know, there were certain things that you just weren't supposed to do. Ah, oh, Mariella. Well, how do you think he feels, poor sod? Because that nine-year-old who said no, that was probably the last chance he ever had to do it. Ever since then, he's had people saying no to him. I think men have been very, very brave about it over the years, but I think that has also got a lot to do with the fact that men do have um, a strange and rather inflated sense of their own attractiveness a lot of the time. Guys have to live with an, a level of rejection that women would find completely intolerable. I've seen a midget of 40 stone go up to Al McPherson on a Saint-Tropez beach and ask her out. And you just think, no, it's not going to happen. You know, it's like me marching up to Brad Pitt and going, come on, you know you want me. And they go, no, I don't, actually. And there are no rules. There's no conspiracy of men gathering together behind the cricket pavilion. And it's just a big headache, isn't it? Is it worth it? Nah. Check this out. Hello, darling. <laughs> Won't be long now, will it? Oh. I, I might put this on, but only in a rather sick fantasy, I think. Stop, stop, stop. I don't want to know all that rubbish. <laughs> There's no way on earth I'm going to go and buy a six pound of potatoes and strap it on my tummy to find out what my girlfriend feels like while she's having a baby. A baby's that heavy? Good God. Well, I think an empathy belly, that doesn't tell you anything like what it's to be a pregnant woman. It's like carrying a rucksack. You know, you can ask a Swedish tourist what it's like to be pregnant. Well, I've tried carrying a rucksack on the front, and it, it's not the same. Nine months is a long time to be carrying a rucksack. Well, my partner doesn't actually need an empathy belly. 
bless and love him. He's got a little porch of his own, little little. I think an empathy belly years ago was called a beer belly. You know, I've got lots of mates who've got those anyway. <laughs> I do feel extremely foolish walking around with this on. You can't possibly find out the emotional things and the hormonal things and, and the why you suddenly want to eat cold fritters. I think British men would re resist this. This is definitely should be left in America. Some guy with an empathy belly on, you're going to say, what a book. <laughs> Everyone's laughing at him. What a wally. <laughs> Mr. Henpeck, Mr. Pussy Whipped. It's like saying I could give you an empathy willy and you would know what an erection felt like. It's, it's all too much in women's favour, the whole pregnancy thing. Is, is, it, is it that big a deal? Come on, we're suffering as well. We have to go about sex, what's going on? The women are doing this and doing that and doing that. So these women are becoming to be monsters out there. Kind of gonna haunt me or something. A 90s woman, what is that? Yeah. A cross between the Spice Girls and the Millennium Dome. So I'm very kind of angry. I, I don't like this thing about men's movements, women's movements. My thinking today is it's retro, it's wanting to go back. The men here tonight are part of a group that's gonna be exploring issues such as relationships with women. Some men are confused, others are excited by the challenge that's presented to them uh, by women in the 90s. Others are obviously very threatened. Mm. Nice, yeah. In the old days, men sort of didn't try and communicate with women particularly. This is a sort of modern phenomena. Men want to know what it means to be a man, what it means to be male, what does it mean to be masculine? What does masculinity mean? I don't have the answers. Everybody feels insecure about something. And the more honest people are, then the more we'll all like each other. But I mean, I know I'm not going to join a kind of Indian drum banging group in Wiltshire. Wise Women Workshops are a response to a need that I found in so many women who are not comfortable with who they were or who they are and the roles they are expected to play. So this is a, a quest for the true feminine essence, something that I think has been lost over the centuries. It's much easier not to take responsibility for yourself. It's much easier to let men do all the thinking and uh, all the active stuff and all the hard work. So, so we actually have given our power away to an extent. Women feel very angry about, about the way they've been treated, but, but that's OK. That can be very empowering. The important thing is not to lock it up inside, hold it inside. The important thing is to get it out, get rid of it, deal with it. For so long, particularly in the UK, there was that stiff upper lip and you never shared your troubles because, you, damn it, we're British. I don't think it's something that I could ever get involved with. You know, I'd be goofing around. They wouldn't want me there. I'd be thrown out. The thing is, I have no natural rhythm at all and I know I'd spoil the harmony because everybody else would be drumming like that and I'd be sort of just a little bit out, you know, and everyone would just get very bad tempered and cross. The local people, they think we're a little bit strange. On one side, our neighbours are quite happy with what we're doing. On the other side, I think, I believe they think we're lunatics. What, banging a drum and wearing feathers? Only if it was fancy dress. I think I'd rather have a pedicure, really. I think part of this whole process is that, at the moment, women are challenging men and now men are challenging themselves and I will imagine in the future that at some point men will start to challenge women as well. It's an evolving process. Oh no, men should never try and understand women. As soon as they understand us, we've lost. I don't like that at all. We've got to keep tricking them. But I don't think they're going to get to the root of uh, how women tick by sitting in a room full of men. I feel like this, I feel like that, I feel like going out and shagging someone else. Where will it ever end? It's a very dangerous game. Men have got a therapy group, it's naturally exists, it's called the public bar. And you go down there with your mates and you moan about how horrible your wife is to them. 
and you say she don't understand me and then you have eight pints and you go back and everything's wonderful in the world and that's the only therapy you need. How many people do you actually see in the pub really revealing the true feelings? In the pub environment you can often uh, move away from things that are difficult by having a laugh or in fact buying an, another round of drinks. What do men discuss in pubs? Rubbish. <laughs> Football and birds. Sports, women and probably women again. Footy, women, Football predominantly, I think sport. Men talk about women. Simple as that. What do men talk about in pubs? Well, yeah. Football, football and girls. girls. What else is there? That's it. And men in pubs are absolute prats, as you know. Um, the first six points you talk about the women you've screwed. Some men do tell the truth about how many women they slept with. But a lot of them don't. And you can tell because they're bad liars as well. How many women have I slept with? Um, um, four. Oh, about six. Honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, around 30. About 40. Just one. My way. It won't. Jesus, mine must be way up in 2000 plus. And uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that, but neither am I defensive. And I've been around since 1958. You have five guys in a pub all busily talking about football or work or politics and bullshitting away and one of them is thinking Jesus I'm really worried about my marriage and it's really on the rocks and I wish I could talk about it but I don't want to seem like a wimp in front of the other guys and the guy next to him is thinking Christ my girlfriend's giving me such stick and I wouldn't mind talking about it but they'll all think that I'm a bit of a twat and if you do get down to it by the following when you forgot what you said anyway right I want my shoes back now oh trials and tribulation of being a woman I would definitely be a house husband tomorrow. What's we take it off? Chicken risotto. I mean, the thing about Princess Di was that she had everything, didn't she? Very glamorous, very sensitive. I think she's fantastic. <laughs> BBC One, Josie talks about her life as a prostitute. the beginning of the beat on Withington Road. That bit across that divide is the residential area and we did not spill out onto there. So you would start along here and you'd find little clusters of girls, two or three it may stand, or one on her own, depended which way you wanted to work. But you all had your own little patch and you respected the other girls. If by accident you came out onto their bit, they'd soon let you know by giving you dirty looks and you'd move quite quickly. This is the house on Withington Road where I had a flat. It was on the ground floor at the front, there's the window. We had a, a big red glass vase that we used to put in the window when the room was occupied so the other girl would know not to come in unannounced. So you'd have to remember that every time you came in with your client, you'd have to go and put your vase in the window and troll off back out again when you'd finished and wait your turn. How long would that take? 15 minutes. Five sometimes. <laughs> Depends on the um, self-control the man had. out with two friends of mine and we used to go in a club there was a crowd of lads who used to come in as well and my husband was one of them quite nice looking and I thought I'll do so anyway we manipulated it and Ellen one of my friends went with one guy and I went with him and we used to go out in foursomes I liked his quietness and he was quite shy as well. 
I didn't want anybody pushing or dominant. So I thought that'll do nicely. We both had nights out and who was in would mind the children. And it was an unwritten rule between us and any other couples we knew. Once you got that night out, you didn't give up or else you'd lose it. So if it was a Wednesday night, you went every Wednesday night. And my friend who had these nights out with me was going away on holiday with her family. So I said, what will I do now while you're away? I'll lose my nights out. So she said, well, you'll have to go. Go in the union where we'd been going drinking. So I went really nervous at God. I wasn't used to going out on my own. And I was approached by a chap. Are you looking for business? I didn't really know what he meant, but I thought I had a, a, an idea. I mean, I was quite sheltered from that kind of thing. So I said no and go away. And the barman at the time who worked at the pub said, look, that chap's all right, I know him. And so I said, well, what the hell does he want? So he said, well, he's offering you money, isn't he? You're not stupid, are you? Well, I was stupid because I didn't know. So I said, well, tell him no. And so he, he kept looking over and saying, are you sure, are you sure? And I kept looking away, wouldn't make contact with his eyes. So that night ended and I went home. And on the Friday, which was my night out again, I went in and the same thing happened. And then to this day, I don't know, I just thought, right. And I did it. I mean, when I thought about it, when I, I couldn't sleep that night when I got home. And I was re-going over it in my mind and thinking, God, wait till she comes back and I tell her she's going to go absolutely mad. She'll be disgusted. My friend. about your husband, didn't you worry what he would think? Well, I wasn't going to tell him, was I? So that didn't come up. That was a secret. And never, ever was I going to mention it. Come in. Right. Come over here and sit down. Put that on the table, Josephine. Good girl. I developed into this oh, yes. dominant service on request, which I thought was funny at first, and then I realised there was a job to be made from it. Get yourself controlled. That type of client who wanted to be dominated didn't consider himself worthy of sex, so he didn't ask for it, which suited me absolutely fine. So I'd become then a dominant dummy-tracks. This is the cat. It stings quite a lot, so I'm told. Swishes about quite nicely. Makes a nice little whoosh. This is a paddle. That side obviously hurts more than that. Brought by a naughty boy who believed he deserved that. And with this one, that's nice when they're over your knee. You can really make the bottom glow nicely with that. These belong to somebody quite special. He likes to wear these. They're a size 11. He wears a black basque, a wig, a white gag and bright red lipstick. And he's tied to a chair in front of a mirror where he can see himself and his little game is he's in this bondage and he's futile and he's struggling to get free and he knows there's no chance of freedom unless I say so. What do you say in your ads? Auntie awaits all naughty boys to mend their ways. So, I wait. And they know they're going to be punished? Well, they know by that, that she's what I'm looking for. So then they usually ring up and give you a brief outline of what they really want. 
This would be something like what the maid would wear. And that's a man? Yeah. This is for a French maid. Um, this would be similar to what a schoolgirl would wear. Where do you get these? Collect over the years. You can buy them from places. Some I have made. This is the baby outfit that Babykins wears. And it's got little frilly knickers that go with it. And a nappy and a little bottle. And a little plate with its own little spoon. And these are just, uh, what, transvestites who want to dress in women's clothing wear. Wear the underwear, suspenders, stockings, wig, makeup, false nails. And get transformed. And they're quite pleased with it. And then they get changed back into the self and that's it. Till next time. I never knew my dad. He was in the army. I can only presume he was away at whatever soldiers do. And I don't remember much about him. I remember him coming home on leave a few times and going back, but he was missing most of the time. Did your mum have other? Not, no, not at that time, no. When? After. Uh, my dad had separated. Shortly after my brother was born, she didn't bother with anyone. My grand lived next door. And she didn't bother with anyone for quite some time. What do you really think she felt for you? You're nothing but trouble. Now, I don't know why that sticks in my mind. Maybe she's constantly said it. I wasn't any, I wasn't trouble. I was always too frightened to be trouble. But that's what I was told. You're nothing but trouble. And you should get sent back to your father. Sometimes I used to think, well, why don't you send me then? Punishments went in stages. They'd be like a favourite punishment of the time. But one was the staircase. There was no electricity for a start because it was gas, so you didn't have a light on the stairs. And when all your bedroom doors were shut, the staircase was very dark, and at the bottom, to keep the drafts out, there was another door. So the actual stairs were pitch black. And I would be tied with my hands behind my back and a gag, like a scarf or something, to stop me screaming for my gran who lived next door because she'd come running if I shouted and screamed for her. So you were tied in the dark mm. to the stairs? Mm. How long for? Well, it seemed a long time to me. I don't know how long it was, but until she felt like letting me out. My grandma kept me going through everything. She was always there. She didn't believe in smacking or punishment. And she'd sometimes say, you've been hitting her again, haven't you? And I would never tell. And my mother would deny it, but my grandma always knew. Why did you never tell? I was frightened. Of? To tell. Frightened of what would happen if I told. You might have been taken away from her. I was too scared to take the chance. I think I'd have liked to have been taken away. I think I used to have an imaginary game. There was an outside toilet in the yard and I used to have a little umbrella and a toy suitcase. And I used to sit in the outside toilet for hours on end, pretending I was on a train going somewhere away. And I played that game for years. I used to try and find futile little ways of gaining favour, like, pinching flowers on the way home from school and bringing them to her. But then you'd just get a slap, really, because you'd stole the flowers, which I don't disagree with now. But at the time, I thought it was rather unfair. But I did love her. But from a distance.
the door to yourself. As soon as my child was born, my mother changed overnight towards me. It was absolutely marvellous. Adored the child. And I could have anything I want. I never asked, but I could have had anything I wanted. She just changed. Now, you lost your daughter. Mm. How did that happen? She fainted and choked on a vomit. Very unexpected. How old was she? Ten. What was her name? Gail. That must have been... It was awful. And uh, a very big milestone. Mm. And I think I went very hardened then. Prior to that, I was still pretty soft and reasonably shy, but I seemed to just go hard. Don't know if that's a defence mechanism or what, but it didn't do me. It doesn't do any harm to be a hardish. I developed a crush on a lady that lived nearby. And I was fascinated by this woman. I used to follow her wherever she went, not wherever she went, but I would accidentally on purpose be where she was. And I couldn't quite understand this because she became, she came in my thoughts quite often. So I told my husband about this and said, I'm a bit worried because I'm having these thoughts about her. And he said, oh, women go through those phases. I didn't disbelieve or believe. But it was plain on my mind because I thought, other people don't have these thoughts. I'm quite sure of that. And my friend used to stay on a Friday night because she couldn't get a bus home. And she used to sleep downstairs. So I was chatting to him this, about this problem. And he said, look, the only way you're going to get out of this is do it and then it'll be done with. So I said, well, like, how? So he said, well, she's downstairs. So it was more or less a bit of a dare or provocation or what, but I thought, right, well, I will. So I went down and I didn't come back up. And that was that. This should go on forever. I thought I was the only one until we found that there were others that went in the union my friend and I and dared each other to go and find these real ones. And we were astounded. I'll forever live in sin. This should go the procedure was that all the girly girls would sit at tables and all the dykes would saunter about. And if you were fancied, they would let you know with eye contact. It was like another world. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, it was like Wonderland. Another opening, another show in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore. A chance. And it was everything we'd been led to believe. Another opening of another show. Somebody was on stage singing, and it was turned out to be a drag act. We'd never seen one before. And in another room, there was all the latest tunes being played on a jukebox. So really, there was absolutely everything you could look for in the one place. That was our little world. And that's where we went. And then when we came back to our own little mundane life, we were back to normal for a while. Till your next trip. Double life. So you were in a loveless marriage, you were a lesbian, yet your clients were all men. Wasn't that very difficult physically? Didn't think about the sex bit because it was very quick. And you're thinking about your next one. Oh, 
what you could buy with your money. I didn't feel guilty about it because I was saving up to have a place of my own and to leave my marriage. For his sake, as well as mine, it was getting nowhere. So I had a reason, a goal in mind. Well, I didn't dare open a bank account and I had a hiding place in the doll's pram in the hallway. And I used to tape it into there with sticky tape. One Sunday morning, I was in bed with my husband. I think he was reading the paper or something. And the kids were playing out on the front. And next thing, they're shrieking. And I looked out the window and the doll's pram had zipped up. And this money was floating in the wind all over the street. Well, I was, I was really scared. So I ran down and I was in my nightdress picking it up and really screaming, you stupid sod, what the hell are you? So he is looking through the window by now and sees me picking all this up. Well, my brain just had to work overtime and think, what, where's this come from, what's up? Obviously, he wanted to know where it was from. So I told a lie and said I'd won it and that I was saving it to take us away with. took the whole family away to Jersey, six of us. And I wasn't that pleased, snarling a bit under my breath. So did you start again? Yeah. And I didn't get found out that time. I made sure no money was found or accidentally found a better place to hide it. She, Josephine! I'm sorry. She didn't do the corner here. Well, that's not her fault, it's yours. No, 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 no. You're too damned eager, aren't you? I am. They're the lowest of the low. They're a slug slithering about on the floor, fit to only have feet wiped on them. They're a doormat. They're a nothing. And what are you? I'm a nothing, madam. That's what we're here for to work, I'm not here to just uh, doll around like sissies. That's right. Which we are sissies, but we're working sissies. That's true. And what are you, Janine? I'm the same Yeah. You're a slut with it though, aren't you? What are you? A slut, madam. Speak up. A slut, madam. That's right. And are your clients seedy men in raincoats? No. no. You'd like. They're yeah. thoroughly nice people. They're all different. There's different professions, there's city gents, there's workmen, there's taxi drivers, there's builders, blacksmiths, anything. Janine is showing her underslip. Pull it up a little bit, madam. Yes, pull it up from underneath. They're just everyday people. That's better. Number 14's a slave who doesn't deserve a name. He's so unimportant. He's a number. And he's quite happy. He wishes he was number one or near. But it, number 14's quite far. But little does he know how does he know how long the numerals go? He could be quite near the top, but I don't tell him. And he's used for Dirty jobs like sweep the garage out, sweep the shed out, pick the leaves up, and do generally unsavoury jobs. How do you know how far to push it? It's an inner sense. You just know and you don't cross over. If you did, you'd just ruin everything. You'd spoil it for the guy, you'd spoil it for yourself and you just wouldn't enjoy anything. Two happy girls, aren't you? We are. Oh, I know what you mean, Janine. I wish you'd more up, I know. How old can you go on doing this? Forever. Do people? Well, I know somebody who's well into a pension age and no signs of stopping. Quite happy. She's in the same line as you? Mm. Beating 
Mm. See, if you both came more often, that all these jobs would get done in bits. But you've got to be put to bloody work yes, when you're absent, Janine. Yes, mm. I come as often as I can. Clients yeah. used to tell me afterwards, after the game had finished. Mm. I really enjoyed that because you enjoyed it. And you came across as though you really enjoyed what we were doing. And I did enjoy it. You liked humiliating them? You... Well, I suppose so, yeah, looking at it. But it didn't seem like I was providing them with what they wanted. So I didn't dislike them, even if I was saying nasty things to them. It didn't mean I didn't like them. It was the game that we were playing. And I think knowing that that game had ended anyway, and you didn't really mean it, so it makes a difference. Now, as a child, you'd been on the receiving end of mm. something that wasn't a game. Mm. And you'd been dominated. Well, maybe that's why I was so good at it. <laughs> maybe I'd had good training. Like I'd say to a naughty boy, so to speak, do not try and lie to me, because I can tell if you're lying. Well, that's what she used to say to me, so there you are. So maybe I had good training. So your mother taught you? Maybe. I think my mum was a real... well, bitch, I'm sorry to say. With me, anyway. My brother was the sun shining a life. He was a little darling. He could do no wrong. She absolutely adored him. And she didn't make try and hide it. The sun shone out of his backside. I don't know why, unless it was to make up to him the fact that his daddy had gone, but so had mine. So I never understood that. Still don't. I just used to think, I must have done something, but I never knew what. Sometimes I used to think, well, it must be a right little sod for her not to like me. Quite hated myself, really. I don't think she had any right being how she was. I don't think anybody should be like that. But I've nothing to thank her for. And I don't owe her anything. Yeah. I've got a lovely girlfriend now. We met in a club about ten years ago. And then we had a brief encounter. And five years ago, we met again. No. We've been together ever since. Do you mind that she's a prostitute? No. It doesn't bother me at all, because she's not doing anything wrong. She's providing a service yeah. for men. Right. I've been looking for one of them since last year. Yeah, we've got to see what it looks what like. What do you think? Oh, yes, oh, yes, very yes. Good. What do you think? And you've got it in the right position as well. <laughs> Sometimes she'll put a barrier, barrier up. She's very scared sometimes to let that barrier down. Even with you? No, she's let the barrier down with me. Um, I've got the whole Josie. Look at these cobwebs. Oh, no. Having a good time, that spider. And I always say to her, I've saved the best till last, because I don't think I'll be going with anybody else. I'm quite happy now to spend the rest of my time with her. It's too heavy. You want to spend the rest of your life with her? Yeah, I do, yeah. So, there's nobody else for me. When I was a child, my mum used to take us to town. There was Lewis's Arcade, 
women used to stand there touting and my mum used to always drag us through really quick saying don't look at them don't look at them and I always wondered why and inquired why and was told they were loose women scum of the earth so What would your mum think? Oh, she'd go absolutely potty. She'd probably try and batter me. But what can she do? I'm in charge now. Thank you very much. The tide is beginning to turn, and it is fantastic. I'd like to think that in the workplace, women aren't discriminated against, but you have to face facts. If a woman isn't beautiful physically or internally, she's going to be discriminated against, and I do the same towards men. I know exactly how men's attitude works. If a halfway decent woman walks into a room, the first thing that they're deciding is whether you're worth a shag. A good-looking woman and a smart woman will always win out. I don't think that the industry itself, motor racing industry, has ever really accepted me as um, sort of the chief executive of brands. Being um, a woman in a man's world is a question I've been asked a lot, actually. What is this thing, this man's job? I didn't notice that feeling nearly as much as I noticed um, a feeling, a strong feeling of age discrimination. People took very badly to the fact that I was 22. I don't think there is such a thing as a man's world, because I think it's our world. very hard for me to feel I've been put in a pocket of a woman in a man's world. My world is Birmingham City Football Club and I do my job very well. There are certain industries where it is very difficult to break into and football is perhaps one of those. Under my management this club has seen its best financial results in modern history. Men are intimidated by successful women. Men are intimidated by women full stop. Men have, have actually had the the upper hand for so long I think it's going to be very difficult to relinquish it and I'm damn sure if I was in that position I would hesitate to relinquish it. They're just gonna have to get used to it because the world is changing. I've been told that I can be um, difficult. I found to be heard you had to be, uh, it had to be quite strong. <laughs> as a woman you just have to work twice as hard. I think they all sort of learnt very quickly that I wouldn't take any crap I had a shirt on with one button undone and one of the players said to me, oh, I can see your tits from here or some expression like that. And I said, well, when I sell you to crew, you won't be able to see from there. The money I earn has had an impact on, on how men view me. Men feel intimidated by women who earn more than them. I've known cases where men are so scared of women that they actually can't get erections. <laughs> I don't think women should tell men how much money they earn, especially if they earn a good whack, because if you tell a bloke how much money you earn, right, he's going to start expecting you to contribute to household bills. And I don't think that's what women's money is for, really. You know, that's what they spend their money on. Blokes should spend their money on boring things. We should spend our money on treats for ourselves, on presents. <laughs> It helps to have a career in the 90s, and I'm not downgrading people who choose to stay at home and who choose to bring up children, because it's a great job, and it's an incredible job. Problem is, you don't get paid for it. I think women who spend all day at home, sort of looking after children, uh, can end up being a bit mentally imbalanced. <laughs> you must do your own thing. It gives you your own independence, your own point of view, and your own money. Yeah, I mean, what's your alternative? Dependency. <laughs> Wife who lives in central London, and I have two children, and a husband who is a sporty goods manufacturer. 
I would say that I was a corporate wife and that I entertain the sports, the people in the sports world. I don't entertain bankers. I have friends and acquaintances who are corporate wives. Their husbands work, work very hard. They have to go to all the business dinners. They have to look good. And if they're happy doing that, and a lot of these people that I meet are happy to doing that, then that's great. I haven't worked now for... 10 years. I would have been delighted not to have worked. I really would. I was never one of these women who felt that if I had to stay in the kitchen making pasta collages, I'd kill myself. I really liked making pasta collages. I obviously have time on my hands. I've got a lot of staff here because I'm spoiled back. I, I have um, two housekeepers and um, uh, nanny and uh, butler and chauffeur. <laughs> Basically, I get about £4,000 a month to, to run my life. <laughs> Good on you, sister. <laughs> you know your place. Let's go shopping. I love fashion. I buy from Dolce & Gabbana to Gucci. I love Gucci, of course. Um, it's one of my favourites. I've been married, I can have me bloody decades, and the notion of having to rely on Gordon to say, excuse me, please, can I have some money for this? I just, I mean, it makes me gag thinking about it. I'm a great believer. I like to earn my own money and have my own independence, even though I'm married. I, I feel very strongly about being sort of financially quite secure in my own right. I remember when, when I was young, my mother writing a housewife in her passport under occupation and being horrified and thinking, God, that'll never happen to me. My typical day is I'm usually awake at six o'clock in the morning. And I'll go and do yoga. That's good. The yoga I do for about two hours, two and a half hours. Great. I do an opera class on Thursdays. And I do a photography class with, sometimes with Bob Carlos Clark or with other people. And my voice coach is great. He's also a spiritual advisor. And breathe in, see the force. I'm very fussy over my hair. I go to Nikki Clark every single morning. And I think even if I was broke, I'd do that. I'd have to find somebody. I'd find a junior, junior at Nikki Clark to come and do it for me in my council estate. I love shopping for food and groceries and things like this. Absolutely. So would you know how much a pint of milk costs, for instance? Yes, a pound, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> I don't know everything. I buy every, all my food from M&S and everything costs a pound, as far as I can see. <laughs> I always laugh at it, because everything is priced a pound. I, probably if I was in a council estate, I'd go to, you know, Safeways or something. It would cost a lot less. I'm married to a man who works in an American bank, so I act out the corporate wife bit, and um, I quite enjoy it, really. <laughs> I see it as a sort of as a sort of acting role in a way, you know, I think, yes, I am corporate wife, Mrs. Banker, you know, and I kind of go through the whole thing. I believe in the role in the wife, but in a quite a traditional way, really. I think um, you should do everything for your man, so that if they ever leave you, the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> so I think you should do all their shopping, their washing, every single possible, their ironing, everything. It broke or rich, because if they you know, you can always replace them, but they can't replace somebody that's sort of a uh, superwoman. They call it passive-aggressive, don't they? That sort of, um, it's not me. It's, look at him, he's the important one, but really you're the one who's kind of got the strings of the puppet. Don't all women run their husband's legs on the quiet? <laughs> we just don't let them know that we're doing it. <laughs> First break for me all happens on January the 28th, 97. It was a local agency in Swindon. I knew the girl that ran it and I'd known her for some time. And she called me in and asked me to come in for a casting. And it was for a double glazing company. Um, they basically offered me the job there and then. That involved me basically being on a poster advertising double glazing. I had sort of bra and mickers on and the posters were being pinched and the press was sort of quite interested in it. My son rang me at eight o'clock in the morning and said, we want this girl, is she one of yours? So I said, well, she's not one of anybody's yet. She hasn't actually started modelling full time. So I rang her, told her her pictures were in the star and that the sun were jumping up and down with excitement and did she want to come to London today? And I did and I basically didn't go home for about the next three or four days. I think it was all souped up by the papers. They needed someone and it was her. I think the appeal of Melinda Messenger is 
that she is so approachable. There are more girls around that look like Melinda than look like Linda Evangelista, and I think um, that's why people are prepared to accept her more. She's, she's a very pretty girl, but she's not the most beautiful girl you've ever seen in your life. Find out again, the golden girl. Let's give her a hand, give Mel a hand. I think that page three is a bad thing. I really do, because it gives men an opportunity, boys, to look at a woman like that in a vulnerable position and see that woman as an object. When I see some beautiful young girl bearing her breasts on page three, I think it's so demeaning to women. What do I make of page three models? My family were absolutely shocked when I started doing page three. Tasteless, gratuitous. I think it would be a shock for anyone who opened a paper and saw their sister, their daughter, <laughs> topless in the front. I think it would be a shock to anybody. It was a shock to me. I used to think that it was really degrading and these poor girls were being completely shoved into the camera and forced to do it. But you know, I've met some and they love doing it. Head up. That's it. Yeah. Good. I wanted to be a page three girl. Because when I was younger, the page three girls were famous. It was like Sam Fox was famous and I wanted to be like Sam. Remove the hair from the cleavage. I've always done very glamorous pictures of girls, but the last five years has been more, more sex. Girls wearing nothing and next to nothing. I do sometimes get girls in positions where men wouldn't get them to look like I do. It's sexy. And they feel more at ease with me being a woman. I think sometimes you can feel a bit safer with a woman, especially because there are a few dodgy men photographers. When I first started, men would say, I'll sleep with me and I'll make you a star. They're almost genetically programmed to be page three girls. It's a, it's a fate of, of nature. I can't smell too much oil oh, crack. <laughs> and I can't breathe because it's too tight. <laughs> I think page three is great, you know, because I think it's a celebration of the female form. Um, and I don't think it's degrading to women at all. There's a whole um, group of people there who buy the newspapers, who enjoy it, who just take it with a pinch of salt, which is exactly what people should do. There's too much fuss and upset about it. I don't, know, I don't know what the big fuss is about. If you like it, buy the paper. If you don't, turn to page four. The fact that it is done, that it is bought, and that people want it is regrettable. I think the fact that page three girls can go out on page three and say, here are my tits and I'm very, very happy with them, is great. It's a job. It's their job to model. It's my job to take their pictures. And without me and them, the newspapers wouldn't survive. I've been waxing lyrical since I've seen Melinda Messenger and her fantastic breasts. I had breast enlargement before I started modelling purely for my own reasons. It's certainly not something that I've regretted doing. For all I know, she's perfectly intelligent. I have got 11 O levels. And she has got control over her career. As long as I say I don't want to do something, I don't do it. But then don't get your tits out. It's a way of making a living. It's just interesting still that a woman would be paid more for just popping her top off love than she would be for getting a good degree. Why not? It may well be that when she's 40, her time is gone. Her time is here now, and she's making the most of it. Every day that I get to do this, I just see that as a bonus and, and see that, you know, and feel very fortunate and very lucky. Um, and if it all stopped tomorrow, then I'd just be really glad that, you know, I've done the things that I've done so far. Yay! I'm a mum. Of course I have guilt. Oh, my baby, my baby. I do table dances, and then you get £10 for it. I find it almost impossible to understand why any woman would become a nun. L'Oreal Plenitude Futury, the new moisturising fluid with pure vitamin E. My skin looks smoother in one day and seems younger in just one week. Your messages. The photographer's waiting and your coffee's on the desk. Sorry to keep you, but I really don't have much time. Neither do I. Did someone give you coffee? Mm-hmm. Gold blend. Don't let yours get cold. Look in the camera. Hold it there. Want some more? Look away. Look at me. You can relax now. Nescafe Gold Blend. Uniquely roasted for a golden aroma and a richer, smoother taste. I guess I'll see the results in the magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, how close were you? Very close. 
So how did it all go? I'm afraid the board rejected your big idea. What do you mean? Calm down, John. They didn't like your idea. Better luck next time, mate. Something I said? Thanks to its torsion beam suspension, the Rover 200 is the perfect car to unwind in. I've had a better idea. The Rover 200 from 9,700 pounds. With the Sainsbury Schools Reward Scheme, you can turn your shopping into a huge range of free equipment for your children's school. Sainsbury School Rewards. Just ask in store for details. I heard that charges. So what's this? May I charge you for wearing teeth today? Wearing teeth? You are wearing teeth, aren't you? May I charge you for holding a very long bag? Oh, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. We're charging for dogs with pink objects in the mouth. You've got a side parting in your hair. It'd be 50p. Oh. Are you looking at that pigeon? Well, we're charging for that today. This is a boy, <laughs> Travelling in threes has been charged today. Can you split up a bit? No one likes charges, especially from a bank. That's why at First Direct, everyday banking is free. We're charging for shoes that make that little tippy-tappy noise. Pound for step. First Direct, 24-hour telephone banking. No charges, no nonsense. You can travel the world, but you won't find a shampoo quite like this. New L'Oreal LV Nutrivitamin Shampoo. Just shampoo and let science do its thing. L'Oreal LV with Nutrivitamins E, P, P and B5. Glossy, shiny, manageable hair. New L'Oreal LV Nutrivitamins Shampoo. Then tell yourself you're worth it. WPC for the Metropolitan Police. I specialised in sexual offences. I spent six years working for them all in all from 1985 to 1991. I really wanted to make a go of it but I joined too young, I was too much of an airhead. Just too excitable at the time. It wasn't the job for me. Now I'm basically earning double what I used to earn in the police force and it's a lot easier as well. I do table dances on request and you strip down to nudity or just topless depending on the gentleman's preference. And then you get £10 for it. We have certain rules and regulations that a, dance, that a dancer adheres to to make the place more professional, less tacky. We're not allowed to be seen walking around in our underwear, partly dressed. You're not allowed to be seen leaving the premises with a customer. You're not allowed to touch yourself in an explicit manner. When somebody's looking at you and you're totally naked and they're appreciating what they're seeing, whether it be in a sexual way or not, it's, it's still very enjoyable. It's, it makes you feel good about yourself. The proper way for people to address me is as mom, and quite a few people do call me mom. Uh, sometimes they call me sir by mistake, uh, or else they call me Miss Neville, or, which is more friendly, I think, they call me either chief or boss. There are 43 chief constables in England and Wales, and two of us are women. Fake actions we've had recently. Uh, stand, please. Morning, everyone. Morning, Thanks my Thanks very mom. much. Morning. I'd always felt that I wanted to have children. And many people thought it was wrong for me to be at work and leave the baby at home with the au pair. If you're married and you have children, you cannot have a career too. It doesn't work. And that's why the children are taking drugs, the husbands are rushing off with somebody else, and we've never had the marriage broken up in the way we have today. When I became a single parent, the children were still quite small, and I really had a lot of support from my parents and from the nannies whom I had at the time. I didn't see a conflict between children or career. I didn't see it as being either or. Are there any issues that you've got for me while you've, while you've got me here? A great deal has been done uh, to promote fairness and equality in the police service. 
but we couldn't possibly say that we've arrived at our destination yet. There was one time when I was uh, going for a promotion interview when I was pregnant, and I knew that if they knew that I was pregnant, that I wouldn't get it. I just knew that. They were pretty cross that I hadn't told them, and it was made clear to me that if I had, I wouldn't have got the job. And that's interesting, because that was 11 years ago, and I assume that that wouldn't happen now. But I've encountered women officers since, uh, just recently, who haven't disclosed that they were pregnant when going for their promotion boards, and who've said to me afterwards, well, I know what the organization says, but I thought it was too risky, better to say nothing. So that attitude still prevails. I had more of a problem in the police force with backbiting and bitching than, than this industry at all, you know. There's no comparison. I've got a great deal of admiration for Elizabeth Hill. I think, yeah, good on her. I think she's, uh, she was obviously in the right job. <laughs> um, but for women going up the, the ladder in the police force, it's, it's very difficult. Um, it is a very strange connection, isn't it? Every now and again, it used to come out, what did you used to do before this, the customer would say. And he'd say, oh, I used to be a police officer. And now it turns out to they wouldn't believe me anyway. I went to a convent school, and I find it almost impossible to understand why any woman would want to become a nun. I should think it's extraordinarily attractive, the idea of becoming a nun in the 90s. I guess if you were really wanted to sort of not go with the stress of thinking, yes, I'm a 90s career woman and I'm equal to men and everything like that, a nun would be a perfectly viable option. Nuns have got to recruit nuns because they're running out of them. There's a school here that closed recently because basically they ran out of nuns. Why would a woman want to be a nun in the 90s? That's a very good question. <laughs> I haven't a clue. asked Mother Simeon, who, whose idea it was to play football, why football? And she said, well, when we played handball, um, the ball kept bouncing out on top of the older sisters who sit on the sidelines doing their knitting. And so she said, I thought, if we kicked the ball, it would keep it near the ground. Some days you have good days where you score a lot of goals, and some days you don't. Depends who's on your team. <laughs> Don't look for finesse, which is important in football, I believe, but um, there's no finesse in our football. My football days are over. <laughs> when you join us, you join an institution where uh, outside distractions, as far as possible, are kept away. We never go out, except for very serious reasons. Uh, we live our whole life within the confines of the convent and our life is geared to prayer. So when you become a Tiber nun, you, you really come in for life. I quite like it when I meet people who are religious and, and can back up the reasons why they are religious. And I think it's really beautiful that someone can believe in something so much. It does seem a jolly strange thing to want to do, but not being a religious person, I would say things like that. I think, you know, being a nun, it's like, you know, if God had wanted you to walk around in a ridiculous outfit, never ever having sex, you know, ever again, and, and, and just, you know, giving all your money and everything, you know, then why would he have given you a pair of breasts? <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to wear those headdresses. They don't want to drive around in Subarus with those things on, and then eventually, when they're 40, they all have to wear national health glasses, and you just don't look good. We don't watch television. We don't even watch videos because we, we thought if we're not watching television, we might as well go the whole way and, and not even watch what has been on television. We only listen to radio on the very rarest occasions, very important occasions. As far as possible, you don't talk. But you may talk for reasons of charity or courtesy. Can you imagine it? Well, obviously, we wouldn't be allowed to become nuns. I think you have to be, don't you have to be really well behaved to even become a nun? You have to be quiet for quite a long time, don't you? <laughs> no, no, I can't. I Can mean, it's such a life of deprivation, isn't it? Having sex again. Depriving yourself of just speech. How? Alcohol. <laughs> they can speak. We do, not most of the and time I think they, they can can't. drink as well. No. I'm sure they can. All the nuns ask me to have a quick speak of the <laughs> No! 
I find them quite frightening. I'm not even Catholic, so I've no reason to find them. I've never been beaten up by one. But um, I think it's that sort of... I know they do good works, but it is that ultimate opting out of society. I just think it's terribly selfish. I've met nice nuns. I'm not suggesting every nun is a loony or a monk, but I think it's some form of escape. It has to be. You're, you have to be saying, I don't want to deal with normal life. I don't want to work at Marks and Spencer's. I, I don't want to try and get a flat. I'm 27 and I've been here for about four months. I did a law degree and I went to Chester and got my law finals. To cut a long story short, I, I went on a pilgrimage with my mother and um, I suppose I had some sort of conversion there. My family were a bit shocked initially, but then I think they came round to the idea. I'm going to be a nun because just boys are too complicated, too difficult, too much like hard work. I don't think it's particularly odd. Lots of my friends, especially in the last few years, I've noticed become very spiritual or they've turned to religion or something. If I'd entered a few years ago, I think it would have killed me. <laughs> I miss Coronation Street um, and The Simpsons. <laughs> I really worried about chocolate. I, I don't know why it was the one thing I really worried about giving up. It seems to me just very tragic that anyone would want to retire from the world to that degree. But there are people who do, and it suit their life suits them. I wouldn't be any good anywhere else. This is, this is my job. This is my life. I think there's a lot of pressure on women in the 90s to really be superwoman. They have to be extremely successful in their career. They've got to be the best wife, a gourmet cook, and basically do everything. I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning with my daughter. It's breakfast, it's tidying up the house, it's getting her to the childminder. I do think about her during the day, and that is an additional pressure that men don't have. Who's going to look after the children? We have a whole society of children being brought up by nannies and au pairs. It is very exhausting now. I mean, have we bitten off more than we can chew? I think that everyone has a very hard time juggling it. I'm always amazed when I look around, say, this office, the tremendous hoops and lengths that people go to, in whether it's in terms of getting up very early in the morning, getting their children into daycare, scampering out at night on an incredibly tight and very stressful schedule to pick them up. I think a woman can have it all. It requires a lot of planning, a lot of organisation. Can women have it all? I don't think so. No, I think that's a myth. My name's Jackie Temple. I'm 35. I'm a director of a company I set up with my husband uh, 13 years ago and I have family, I've got two children, two dogs, and a house, and I juggle. Well, I get up about half past six-ish to get the puppies breakfast, and uh, my husband will get the kids Ooh. up, go downstairs, have breakfast, tidy up downstairs, and go. Hello? Oh, great, thanks. And I get here about uh, half past eight. Hi, I do Rob. the administration, I run the office, so it's not a sort of job where you can not come in tomorrow because you feel like going shopping. And you can't just take a day off. If I'm going to take some time off, I have to really build it in rather cleverly. I need to just run through the programme for the Bahamas. We um, turn over about one and a half million now. So there's always a lot going on. I usually leave here on the days I collect from school at about quarter four, four o'clock. Um, usually after school there's something, you know, someone's got a, a music lesson or it's Tesco night, one of my faves. Um, and then I go home and start again. <laughs> I'm a total failure at juggling everything. It's a complete disaster. I do know women who've juggled it all, but they, but they are extremely tired. <laughs> How do I manage with my juggling? Ooh. She makes lists. She writes everything down. Uh, she makes lists for me as well. Uh, the difference is she actually uh, does everything on her list. You can count on me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> My file of fact is about this big, and I have a really big section of don't forgets. I go to the gym twice a week, and I also play the drums. Good for stress. I like to look after my children myself. I've never had a nanny. I've never had no pair because I don't really believe in them. I don't feel that you have children to palm them off onto somebody else. I don't think working couples with children and a house like we have can survive without help. 
I could write the book on the nannies from hell. Nannies are an essential part of one's life. All in all, we must have gone through 40. I'm so terrified that the girl who helps me will leave, that sometimes I, I give her sort of coats of mine that I don't really want to give her at all, and just sort of, no, have that, take that. Oh, you want some more? Here, have some more money, have some more. Sylvia's been with us for 18 months, and she manages the house, and that's really how we get by. We've had housekeepers that fired us. My nanny has actually told me to off out my own house. I think the thing that really bugged her was when I went to get my OB from the, from the Queen and I wouldn't wear a hat. And Gordon, my husband, wasn't wearing a tie. She thought that was so embarrassing, so I think they just fired us and left. A small minority of women that are nannies today are nannies because they love children. They're nannies because they want to leave home. They're nannies because they didn't pass any A-levels, so they're stuck and they can't get a job. We got Sylvia through an agency. You just have to be so very careful. You never know, and, and your most prized possession, your prized thing in my life are my children, and you hand them over to these people that you barely know that come into your home. Sometimes I just feel in the mornings when I leave very early, what am I doing? Especially at 6.30 on a motorway on the way to somewhere like Yeovil. There is no point in having them if you're not going to spend any time with them. Um, I think if you can balance it all, it's great, but I think if you're just going to be a couple who have children, but you're sort of going to see them on Sunday at lunchtime, you need to sort of think where your priorities lie, really. Children are not objects to be fitted round careers. I have an eight-year-old, and I'm always sort of, especially when I tour as a stand-up comic, I'm always finding myself in motorway stations at three o'clock in the morning, buying her a key ring or a, an ordnance survey map of, of, you know, England, just as a treat, you know. Uh, because I have this terrible guilt. Oh, well, I'm a mum. Of course I have guilt. Oh, my baby, my baby. Of course you feel guilty. I mean, obviously, when they grow up and they go into therapy, it's all my fault anyway. I think this soul-searching, nitpicking about guilt is a, a complete bloody middle-class luxury. I mean, most women don't have the chance. They don't have the option. There's no point meditating about whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing for the kids. If the kids want to be fed, then the women have to work. They've got bills to pay, and it's as simple as that. I do realise I'm extremely lucky because it's our business, and if I was a barrister, I certainly couldn't. I've got a great family, I've got a great husband, great kids, great house. So I'm happy. I think I've got everything. I knew I was perfect. <laughs> I think that definitions of success are changing. Is it to do with amassing lots of money, moving to bigger and bigger houses, which it was very much so in the 80s, the sort of the greed is good culture uh, was, was absolutely um, everywhere. Downshifting comes from a sense, well, I don't want to have to play that game. I want to move back. I want to get back to some kind of real values. And I think people who have the guts and the courage to do it and to pull it off and who turn away from that, all part of their elbow. There was a hype in the city. It was an incredible place to be in the early 80s. I was taking home well over five-figure sums every month. I must have started to spend thousands of pounds every week just on a lifestyle of champagne, expensive food, clothes, Rather than saying, let's go to the park this weekend, I might say, let's go to New York for the weekend and, and I'll pay for it. Some evenings, I wouldn't want to go home, so I'd, I'd check into hotels. And these, these hotels, you know, you're talking two, three, four hundred pounds a night just for three or four hours sleep. And then I can remember picking up shirts, just have a fresh shirt and throwing the old one away. And I might perhaps hire a car just for the day for two, three, four hundred pounds. I can't remember, but it was hundreds of pounds anyway, just for one day's use to take somebody to Ascot or something or whatever. I did start spending quite a bit of money on cocaine, which I just fell in love with. And that cost thousands of pounds every week. And although I didn't realise that I was addicted to drugs at the time, I now realise I was. Someone said to my mother that there was a rehabilitation centre that they had been to in Wiltshire called Cloud's House. While I was there, I started to go to church and felt an immense warmth and belonging the first day I was there. <laughs> I 
went to see the Reverend Neil Thomas, he said, now is the right time for me to tell you that from the first day you came in, I realized God was calling you to ministry. Get it out of your system, do the whatever you want to do, make some money, and then go and retire to the country. Fabulous, yes. Uh, I wish I could do it. <laughs> I could see myself downshifting at a certain point before somebody else told me to. <laughs> Not that I'm paranoid or anything. Downshifting is about trading part of your income for more time, either to simply enjoy life more or to strike out in a new direction in your career. It's about changing your life in quite a, a radical way and accepting that you may be worse off financially, but in return for that, you're pursuing a more fulfilling way of earning a living. Well, it wouldn't do for me. I can't think of anything more boring. Yeah, lovely. Great idea. Romantic and all the rest of it. And then you have two weeks of rain. If you ever think that I'm going to trade down and stop sort of buying convenient foods and make a Sussex prawn pudding, forget it. And everybody's out and, and, and you can't, and there's got no food and you've got to get, and you'd have to travel five miles to go and get any more and there's no delivery pizzas and... Oh, sounds awful, doesn't it? <laughs> it just sounds like my dear of hell. It's not ideal for everybody. Don't burn your bridges, because it's like, don't say, I'm absolutely going to do this, I've absolutely changed my mind, I know I can do this, I just want to live on the land, I never want to answer another telephone. And then you look stupid when you sort of like back down a bit from that about a year later. Just take it in gradual stages, wean yourself off the busy city life, I suppose. I do miss the ability to buy whatever I want to buy. There are occasions when I would like to go on holiday and I can't do that anymore. But other than that, there's not a lot, if anything, that I miss. Boxing really does suit me. Boxing. Women should know better. I was harassed out of my brain. If I don't get sexually harassed at least once a day, I feel desperately offended. I've got about over 100 regulars. My oldest has been 89. <laughs>77% of us have problems sleeping. But 94% say, after a refreshing night's sleep, they can cope with anything. Fact, Creamy Horlicks can help you sleep better and feel better. What a wonderful song, 69% of Horlicks drinkers appreciate the finer points of football. What are these? Um, they're from Happy Video Rentals. Happy? They'll be ecstatic with the money you waste on overdue fines. These should have been back ages ago. Take them back and do the shopping while you're at it. Softener washing powder. Oh. Don't need softener. Money waster. Lovely and fresh. This bold is marvellous. Spend a fortune, would you? No separate softener, so it was over a quid less. Great. I guess I won't be taking the bold back, will I? <laughs> When your pack of hungry little wolves come home from school, give them delicious Nutella on chunky bread and watch them turn into little lambs. Nutella, made with great tasting ingredients to help satisfy a healthy appetite. Thanks, Mum! Nutella helps satisfy a healthy appetite. I'm no shrinking violet. I refuse to let my hair color fade into the background. I use Recital by L'Oreal. Stay true colorants that resist fading mean color won't fade out. Special conditioners mean hair won't dry out. Is your color glorious? Oh, I think it is. And I'm worth it. Fade resistant Recital by L'Oreal. 
better than a diamond ring because it's zirconium, and zirconium isn't going to wear out like diamonds. No. A plus, a brand new body hair enhancement system, which thickens chest hair in seconds, and it comes in five completely natural colours. You'll know. Fat neck, thin neck, long neck, short neck. You got it like that. You tidy it round, and there you go. How do I look? Thankfully, there's no mistaking a McDonald's original like this McRib, succulent, boneless pork and barbecue sauce for an amazing 139. Another great way to enjoy more at McDonald's. British men and many continental men still have a very traditional view of women as secondary creatures who are there to no, look after them. No, I don't think that's true at all. I don't think that's true at all. I think men feel threatened by women full stop. If any man gives me aggravation, he gets one of these. <laughs> men, when they're arseholes in business, other men turn around and they go, gee, he's strong, he's really a toughie. When women are like that, we're not called toughies, we're called something that I can't repeat. It's tough, it's an aggressive age we're in. Sometimes I think, oh, I, you know, I must really calm down, you know, that was unnecessary. It's not feminine, it's not right, she's being a bitch. You have to watch yourself, you have to keep in check. Generally, the 90s is an aggressive place. What is the difference between assertive and aggressive? It's just gender. It's an irregular verb. It's, I am confident, he is assertive, she is aggressive. No, I think aggression helps, to be honest. Nobody ever got going by being shy and softy. I think successful women inevitably behave like men. I personally don't think it's necessary for women to behave like men to succeed at all. I think a lot of successful women are successful because they don't behave like men. They behave like women. They use all the women, feminine guile and intuition to help them climb up the ladder. People should behave in the context of their own personalities. Boxing really does suit me. Any other sport just doesn't suit me. Women boxing? Good gracious. I'm repulsed at the thought of women boxing. I think women should know better. When I told everyone I was going to be a boxer, I don't think anyone was shocked because that's just the way I am. I sometimes think that I'm... I'm from the wrong period in that I still can't take to female boxers or female football players. If it's what the woman wants to do, good luck to her. Um, it takes a lot of training, a lot of stamina. That would be a really male-dominated environment, and I think it would take a very special woman to cut it in that world. I started boxing about two and a half years ago. At the time, I thought that, you know, I'd probably get to be a British champion. I didn't ever dream of becoming a world champion or anything like that. The world title belt, big in it. It's heavy as well. I just thought that I'd do all right at it. And whoever tries to take it away is going to get knocked down. My family at first were worried about me. You know, I had a beautiful black eye and broken cheekbone when I won the world title, but I'm that good, I don't get it that much now anyway. <laughs> My granny loved boxing, and I just can't watch it without kind of going, oh, his face, oh, no, bless him, please. So if women were doing that, I'd get, I'd probably get very upset. If men can do it, women should be able to do it as well. Let them go ahead and have a go. <laughs> I certainly know I can pack a punch. <laughs> no, one man, one man. I usually start training eight weeks before a fight and then build up the last four weeks of really intense training. I spar with professional male boxers. I train properly and I do it right. And I'm the best woman boxer in the world. And I'm the world champ. I suppose you could have sex if you wanted to, because it's good for you, believe it or not. For a woman boxer, it's good. It relaxes you. But um, I don't think there's much chance of me getting much sex here. I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I men are scared of me. I got up in the ring with her um, and had a bit of a bout. She's terrifying. She was so quick. Ah, ah. <laughs> then I'd get away from her. She's battering me. But um, no, she said, that's cool. If women want to box, then fine. Uh, as long as it's protected. It's not natural for women to box. And I don't mean that kind of in, in a Margaret Thatcher way. Oh, my God, that's not natural. I mean, I just think women are above that. I don't like boxing, and I don't want to see a lady do it either. It's not feminine and it's not nice. The more they tell me I can't do it, then the more I'm going to do it. <laughs>
People who feel that women's boxing shouldn't be allowed just they just don't know what they're talking about. Times are changing. No, I don't think that's natural. They're again they're showing their strength. And these gladiators, I have seen one or two, but I've never I've never looked through a full program. <laughs> I haven't worked in an office for a while. I've been freelance for a long time. But when I did, I have to say, I was harassed out of my brain. Oh, God, it makes me so angry, sexual harassment. I once stood at the bar of the House of Commons during a vote, and my bottom was pinched by the chap behind. He's now dead, so I can... <laughs> I can talk about it. I don't think and we I was, take it those, quite that far. Um, uh, well, in those days, I wore high heels, which I don't these days. And so I put my heel in the middle of his foot, and I pressed hard. And I had this sort of... I think that a, that a lot of it, not all of it, is a load of absolute rubbish. Why can't we have a joke? Why can't you kiss at the office party? One of the greatest sadnesses in, in, in a, an environment like a workplace is the diminishment of sexuality. And I don't mean sexual harassment, I just mean sensuality. I just mean the, you know, the hugging and the play of words. I mean, it's all so damn serious. I love a bit of sexual harassment occasionally. If I don't get sexually harassed at least once a day, I feel desperately offended. I think sexual tension is fabulous in an office. I think it's great. I think it's just the stuff of life. I used to have such fun. I think, honestly, this is really terrible. When I started working back, I hate to tell you how long ago it was, 1956 was my first job. If you couldn't flirt with your boss and he couldn't flirt with you, what was the point of going out to work? You could have been out with your mates. Oh, hi, David. Can you come in? Hi. Hi. Couple of things I want to um, to go through for the week. I'm employed as um, a regional manager. I was advertising for a PA, and I'd had um, about half a dozen applications, all of which were female. Good morning. This guy came along and he said, "Look, I know somebody who's perfect for the role." And, and I said, well, what's she doing at the moment? And he said, no, no, it's a he. He's working in the RAF. He's just about to leave. Also, then Wednesday, I've got a meeting at 11 o'clock. And then straight from that meeting, I'm going to go over to Melton Mowbray. I'd been in the Air Force for 10 years. And after about four years, I found out I was going to be posted to the Ministry of Defence as a PA. I can't really envisage having a secretary, having been one all my life. Would I hire a male secretary? Yes, if he fitted the job. They're not as much fun as women because you can't have a good girly laugh with them. <laughs> I'd quite like to have an assistant. I don't really care what sex they are. He tends to get on with his work. He doesn't stop to gossip. I know that from the beginning of the month to the end of the month that David will be constant. He'll be here day in and day out. So I'm not panicking that I'm going to get a phone call to say that he's not feeling too well today. He's under the weather. He's got a stomach ache. So that is a real bonus. I wouldn't hire someone on the basis of whether they're male or female. I'd hire them on how we got on and if they could do the job. A couple of friends have, um, you know, sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, what's it like to have a male PA? Um, and I said, well, he's very, very efficient. No, 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 the other side, what other side? So I think there are always underlying tones that people want to hear about. For me, personally, it'd be better if I had a very, very ugly male assistant, because otherwise I get silly. I get silly ar around attractive young men. I do, I get all... <laughs> and that's stupid. Hi. Yeah, sure, of course, can. There would be a lot of hang-ups with some particular guys, whereby a female asking them to do something, they'd feel it was too inferior to them, to their macho role. She almost asked me to go out and get some personal feminine items, but uh, <laughs> she backed out in the end and got someone else to fetch them, although I did offer. Without a doubt, one of the best PAs I've ever had. Nowadays, women tend to want it always. If a man pays them a compliment, he's guilty of sexual harassment. If he happens to look down their low-cut jumper, well, that's a terrible crime, and he's just a wicked, evil man, isn't he? But why are they wearing the low-cut jumper in the first place? You cannot help but communicate certain things with the way you dress in an office. Most women, I think, have got the sense not to walk, go in in a miniskirt because you've got all that situation of trying to get up from your desk and everything and getting out of cars and stuff like that. If you walk around in an office, with a crotch skimming skirt and a low cut top. You're sending messages and I don't care, you know, you could argue till the cows come home that you, you've got um, the right to wear those clothes and of course you do, but you also have responsibility to accept that there will be certain people who will be drawn towards your 
cleavage or will run their eyes up your legs rather than look you in the eye and listen to what you're saying. And I think that women really have to get real about that sort of stuff. Should prostitution be legalised? I can see the pros, I can see the cons. Um, probably not, probably not. It's a form of income that, that women can make. And I, I, I don't see why, you know, we on our high horses should sort of look down on them and say they shouldn't be doing this or it shouldn't be available. It'll always be available, so why not legalise it? Certainly not legalise something, uh, which is wrong. It's immoral, isn't it? If you think that sex is immoral, yes, it's immoral. But otherwise, I don't, I don't see what the immorality is. If it's the woman's choice. If it's a woman's choice and the customer's choice. I do think that prostitution should be legalised. I mean, it's the oldest career in the world. I think it would be very difficult to legalise prostitution in Britain because I don't think they'd have any customers anymore because I think men only like the idea of it because it's surreptitious and they shouldn't be doing it. If the girls were not on offer, the men wouldn't be there. If the men weren't wanting them, there wouldn't be any point for the girls to be on offer. So you can argue that one round in an everlasting circle. Uh, the fact is, I think it should not be done. The unfortunate part about living in England is that we have never come to terms with any function that happens below the neck. It's a profession, isn't it? You know, women do it very well. I'll be 28 in July, and I've been doing this for about three and a half years. I see about six or seven a day. Most of those are regulars, so I've got about over 100 regulars. My oldest has been 89, but I think he's died because I haven't heard of him since. <laughs> I charge my customers £100 an hour. Sometimes it's just, you know, talking, or if they've got problems at home with their marriage, they just want to, you know, me to help them, really. When I first started, I felt quite abused and everything, but now I've got my rules, and as soon as they come in, I say, right, this is my rules, and I've got to let them know as soon as they come in the room that I'm in control, you know, you do what I want to do, and if you don't like it, then go down the road, you know, and they respect me for that. And nobody has ever made me feel cheap or, or sleazy. Boyfriends have, out of work, but in work I've been respected and, you know, loved, you know, by, by clients. And I respect them for, you know, what they give me, which gives my children a better upbringing and, and I can, you know, do what I want to do. There are some things which are not worth the price and I do not believe uh, it is worth the price of prostitution uh, simply to have a comfortable standard of living. A lot of women um, turn to prostitution when they're desperate and there's absolutely no other avenue that they can go down. I don't think that anyone would pay to go to bed with me, but I would do anything that I had to do to support my children. But the school my boy goes to, there's about three mothers there that are in the playground. They're just like ordinary housewives' mothers that I know work as prostitutes. And you wouldn't look at them twice in the street. You wouldn't know. And they tell their husbands that they're cleaners and work in a nursing home. And they go out to work with their pinny on, you know, to go to the old people's home. And they go straight to their flat and start working. Prostitution must be the last resort, mustn't it? No. I was left a single parent of a young you know, a baby, I had, you know, all the bills and the mortgage arrears, you know, to deal with, with no income, you know, for myself. I've got some jam. It got to the point there's bailiffs knocking at the door. I was so desperate for money, I, I sold everything that I had, you know, my furniture, everything. So all we really had, you know, was the beds in our house. So I had nothing left to sell, so I thought the only thing left is myself. I don't think it's a, really a chosen career for somebody. I think it's actually quite sad um, that it's something that somebody ends up doing. I'm 28 now, and I was involved in prostitution from the age of 15 to the age of 26. I was attacked. I was left for dead by clients. I was dumped 70 miles from where the blokes picked me up. I had clients that robbed me when I worked in a flat. I have heard of women that have been in danger, but it depends on, on the customers that you're prepared to see. There's girls that will just, you know, take any customer in just for the money, then they're asking for trouble. The thing that I find so horrific about it is vulnerability. I mean, how vulnerable, how much more vulnerable can you be? I had um, 
a really close friend who was murdered in prostitution. And she was only 18, just 18. And that was the final straw then, I just couldn't take any more. I meet somebody and then they find out my, my past and that sort of destroys it all. And my baby's father found out about, his family found out about my past and they've never even had anything to do with him, never seen him or anything. And it's all about, you know, the, the baggage that I carry around with me. I'm quite proud of what I do for a job. Um, if people ask me what I do for a living, I'll just come out of it and tell them. How awful it must be to, to come across a stranger and have to be physically close to him. I've got no regrets at all. My life is great, you know, I'm so... I just wake up in the morning, I'm so happy, you know, I've got no debts, no worries. I haven't got to worry about the bills coming in. I can go out and buy this, I can get a nice car if I want, go on holiday. Um, and my children are really happy, because I'm really happy about what I do. Oh, well, it's sad, it's very sad that she's had, that, that she has been reduced to that, or that the money, the enormous amount of money she is earning is, is all that she is thinking about. If she has no morals and no scruples, then fine. I just do not know how they've the courage, let alone forget the moral stuff, that's of no interest to me, but the courage to do that is baffling. It's not glamorous, it's not nice, it's not a good career. It's abuse, it's absolutely horrendous. You'll end up dead. I can't imagine that anybody that has to resort to that can be happy. There are lots of other ways of making an honest living. Lots of ways. Juggling, I hate the word, I hate the concept, I hate the whole thing. I constantly look in the freezer and just hope that the fish fingers have mated overnight and they're gonna be more of them, because I've never had time to do any shopping. I don't think women should be made ever to clean the toilet. Apart from that, I think they can do anything. If I had my time again, I'd come back as a man. I don't think in this day and age we need men at all, but it's a necessity, we, we want, want them. them.